chapter, Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 23, and that will be the only verse that we will consider today. And he, that is Jesus, said to them all, no one was excluded, and no one here is excluded to what Jesus is saying to each of us today. Jesus says to you, and he says to you, and he says to me, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Follow me. Last time when we were together, we began a series titled Hope for a Hurting Heart. And we saw in that initial message that many of our families are hurting. We looked at the various types of families and we stressed that if your heart is hurting in the midst of your family, that there is hope and that the hope is indeed Jesus Christ. But in passing, as we share that word, I mentioned that in today's culture, 50% of all marriages end in divorce. That's a startling statistic. Half of all people who say, I do, don't. However, added to that is the compound equation that 77% of all second marriages fail. And added to that is the fact that 85% of all third marriages fail. The indication in those statistics is that there are a tremendous amount of families that are hurting that are looking for hope in the midst of their marriage. Now, this verse of Scripture may not appear to be one that readily applies to marriage, but I want you to know that it definitely does. Jesus is saying to each of us, as husbands and as wives, and if you're us coming out of a marriage, maybe it would help for you to reflect back and see what transpired. If you're hoping for marriage, maybe you can see what should be a part of what you and someone else puts together as you come together as husband and wife. Jesus said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Now, I like the way the easy to read translation reads it. It says deny and it translates it this way. If any man will follow Jesus, let that man say no to himself. No to himself. Now, once you say no to yourself, then you pick up your cross and you follow Jesus. Now, when we say no to ourselves, I, I want you to see that God is high above, high and lifted up. And his perfect will comes down from him to us. His will is good, it's spiritual, it's eternal. But we live, if you would, here in this plane of time. Our will is temporal. It is tainted. And so as these two wills cross, they form a cross. And if you're going to take up Jesus' cross and implant it in your marriage, then God's will must supersede your will. It must be indeed not my will, but thy will, O oh God, be done. Not only in my life, but in my marriage. So when we say no to ourselves, we are actually coming in contact with the will of God, and we are saying no to me, yes to God. No to me, yes to God. Yes to God in my marriage. Yes to God in my relationship with my wife. Yes to God in my relationship with my husband. Now, I want you to know that my wife and I are a wonderful model of what this represents. We have had 29 wonderful years of marriage. Of course, we've been married 41, but 29 out of 41 is not too bad, I wouldn't think. I mean, what do you think? So here we are, we have this cross that we pick up and we implant it in our marriage. And I want you to see that cross again. I want you to see the cross as it is. There are four pegs. There's one at the top, two at the side, and one at the bottom. I want you to see the top of that cross. It clarifies a critical relationship. A critical relationship. Now, when God created Adam, when God created Eve, God gave them certain gifts. We're not going to enumerate all of those gifts, but we're going to mention two of them. One of them is significance. Of all that God created, 
he walked in the cool of the garden with the most significant of all his creation, Adam. He also gave to Adam and Eve security. I mean, after all, they were bosom buddies with God. When you add these two gifts together, and there are many more, but if you, if you have a relationship with God in the garden, like Adam had, like Eve had, and you have significance, and you have security, then you're going to be satisfied in that relationship. But something came into the garden. The mystery of iniquity. Sin came into the world. And Adam and Eve made a very unwise choice. And when they made that choice, the gifts that God had given them became needs, became needs. It became, as they were removed from the garden, removed from the daily presence of God, it became a need that they began to pursue, a need that you pursue. We all want to feel significant. We all want to feel secure. And when we attain that in one way or another, then we're satisfied as we walk through life. But if we feel insignificant, if we feel slighted, if we feel insecure, if we are filled with insecurities, then we're not going to be satisfied no matter who says what to us. Now, once those gifts became needs, it became needs because the relationship with God was severed. Sin came into the world. Sin separated man from God. But God so loved the world, he so loved you and he so loved me that he sent his son Christ into the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I want you to see the top of that cross, the very apex of that cross reaching up to God and it defines or it clarifies what we're going to call a critical relationship. A critical relationship. Now, sometimes when I or any of our ministers go to the hospital to visit someone, especially if they're in ICU, we ask the nurse, what's their condition? If they say it's critical, Pastor, it's critical, Pastor, we know what that means. It's life or death. This critical relationship with God is life or death for you. You either have that critical relationship restored or you don't. You're either saved and born of the Spirit or you're not. You've either received Christ or you've rejected Him. You've either received Christ or you're on the road to receiving Christ. But my friend, that critical relationship, everything else, every other relationship you have hinges upon the strength of your relationship with God through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Got it? Somebody say got it. Oh, good. That's good. I'm glad you got it. I hope the rest of you get it if you don't have it. Because it is critical. It is critical. It is critical. When you leave this place today, if you have not entered into a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, then you leave here a walking dead man. You are dead in sin. But through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life. And you can receive that and have that relationship restored. And suddenly God will infuse you with significance, create a sense of security within you that you might enjoy a satisfying and abundant kind of life. So as we begin our journey, a critical relationship, and the question is, do you have it? Not asking you if you're Baptist. Not asking you if you're Catholic. Not asking you if you're Methodist. Asking simply, have you entered into a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ? Critical. Now, over here on, on this beam that comes off the cross is a crucial relationship. And over here is another kind of relationship, a casual relationship. Over here is a crucial relationship. It's the relationship you have to people. Over here, the casual relationship is the relationship you have with possessions, with things. Now, fellas, I hate to put the hat on the guys. I promise you I'll put the hat on the ladies in a little while. But over on this end, where we have this crucial relationship with people, the most significant other that you have a relationship with, sir, is your wife. That's right. 
And do you know, she probably has been trying to tell you for quite some time that she has some needs. Now, let's see, guys, if we can guess what those needs are in general terms, broad terms. The first one is going to start with the letter S. Significance. You see, she needs to know that she is the most significant person in your life, that she is number one in your life, that she is on that pedestal because you have placed her there. No one else and nothing else comes before her. It is your responsibility to create within her as best as you're able that sense of significance. But she's got other needs. The second one starts with the letter S. Security. That's right, security. In other words, when life is upside down, when everything is topsy-turvy, when everything is filled with confusion and chaos, there's got to be one place where she can go, where she can place her head, one shoulder that's always there and available to her. And, sir, guess whose shoulder that might be? Yours. Yours. Now, I can assure you that if you strive to do your very best to create in her a sense of, a sense of, of significance and security, she's going to be satisfied in the marriage. I'm not saying you won't have some rough spots. I'm not saying you won't occasionally hit a rut in the road, but she is going to be satisfied. Now, ladies, guess what? That guy, though he may not be able to articulate it, he's got some needs too. And guess what his needs are? Well, the first one begins with the letter S, significance. You know, he may not get any significance wherever it is that he works or that he's employed. He may be doing grunt work and have to submit himself to the authority of someone else. He may even have a better way of doing it than the guy who's his supervisor or boss. But he has learned that, well, he's got to be able to get that significance somewhere. And he's going to get it somewhere, if not from you, somewhere else. He needs a, has another need. It also starts with the letter S, security. That's right. The same needs that a woman has, a man has. If he is secure in the relationship and feels significant in the marriage, then he's going to be satisfied. Now, how do we go about meeting these needs? Well, we meet it in two different ways. Number one, for women, guys, I'm going to tell you how not to do it. School of hard knocks. I think we talked about that last Sunday night. I love telling this little story, but it always gets me in trouble when I go home. I was pastoring my first little church up in Union, Mississippi. It was a hoot and holler kind of time, a town rather, just had maybe one red light little piggly wiggly in town, a feed store, and that's about it. And that's about it. Wasn't much else there. And lo and behold, there it was. I was out there doing God's work. I want you to know that's my cover. I was doing God's work. I was out there visiting and doing visitation and trying to bring people into the kingdom. When I looked at my watch and it was around 4.30, and this little town shut down at 5 o'clock on a Saturday. And suddenly a light bulb came on. Tomorrow is Mother's Day. And so I skedaddled into town, went into the only place that might have something that would supply the urgent need. It was one of those Purina feed stores for horses and cattle and everything else. And lo and behold, I found the most beautiful ceramic magnolia. What it was doing in a food store, I don't know. But there it was. And so I brought it up front, and I said, I'll take this. And uh, the lady put it in a little box, and she put a little bow on it and did the best she could. And the next morning, I gave my honey the ceramic magnolia. And uh, I'll never forget the look on her face, and I'll never forget the word she said. Last minute again, huh? 
So we went over to church and, uh, you know, greatest actors in the world, preachers and preacher wives, I mean, you'd have thought, man, this was the greatest gift to come down for heaven. She's bragging everybody about how she got this little ceramic. I mean, the thing still had dust on it from the store and the price tag stuck on the bottom. I mean, it was so obvious. And we were going to have lunch with a good friend of mine, Brother Jay, and pastored the other church on the other side of Union, Mississippi. Both of him were saved and, and called to the ministry in Williams Boulevard Baptist Church. So, so we went to have Mother's Day dinner, took the children and everything. And, and when they came over to, to meet us at our house, Jane, his wife, came in. And this is about how she came in. And the obvious question is, what's the problem? What's the matter? That James, you ought to see what James gave me for Mother's Day. And Jane said, well, you ought to see what John gave me. He gave me this, this dusty, old, dirty, old ceramic magnolia. You got it at the last minute. so obvious. And James said, well, that's much better than what I got. What did you get? James gave me a kerosene lamp for Mother's Day. And Jane popped up and said, well, the last time the lights went out, you said, I wish I had a hurricane lamp. So I got you one. All I can say is this, guys, that's not how you do it. If there's a key word to meeting the needs of a lady, it's going to begin with the letter R, and it's going to be the word romance, romance. And that's not how you romance your woman. Now, years later, I had a good friend of mine. I was pastoring my third church. It was their anniversary. He didn't have two nickels to rub together. Wasn't blessed with an abundance of uh, financial resources. And Jenny and I and he and his wife, we went out to celebrate their anniversary. And uh, when we got to their house, she came running to the front door. And she said, ooh, 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 I got to show you what Bruce did for me. Got to show you what Bruce did for me for our anniversary. Guys, I know what you're thinking. He probably got a bunch of roses. Those things are expensive. He couldn't afford that. She took us to her refrigerator, and she opened up the freezer door, and she pulled out a little pink envelope. In fact, there were a whole bunch of them lined up there, and she said, every day for 30 days prior to our anniversary, I got a little pink envelope with a little pink note with one petal, one petal. And she said, oh, it's wonderful. It's marvelous. Look what my Bruce did for me. Now, if you don't know what to do, guys, don't tell you. Why? Put your finger in your ears. There is a little book they sell at Walmart that tells you how to do these kind of things. <laughs> there is also a little book that was printed in conjunction with the movie we just showed called The Love There that you could buy at Lifeway Bookstores. The idea is no matter how, romancer, romancer, romancer. Now, ladies, obviously he's got some needs too. Don't go get some pink envelopes and pink paper and some petals and start sending that to your honey. That's not going to cut it for a guy. Most guys are really not into the romance thing as far as those sweet little frittery kind of things. But I'll tell you something that does speak volumes to a man. It begins with the letter R. It's respect. It's respect. You see, most guys really struggle to get respect in this world. They're either going to go get an education. They're going to try and accumulate and save a lot of money. They want a big car. Or a big house, or maybe a big job, maybe a title. We're all striving for respect. And it's usually in the little ways that we get offended when it comes to respect. I always use this illustration. It's kind of a corny one. It really is a stretch. But nevertheless, it illustrates what I'm kind of talking about, how it's always the little things. When we come to church sometimes, we come, up, we come up Judge Perez from down yonder from the city of New Orleans area. We, we come up Judge Perez. And, you know, when we get to Paris Road, i got to take a right to get to the church. 
And invariably, I'm, I'm driving up Judge Perez, and right when we get to where I need to take a right, there's this little squeaky voice sitting in the car next to me that says, turn right here. And there's a little voice inside of me that says, dang, woman, I, I've been driving to this church 19 years. You think I don't know how to get here? Then we get down to St. Bernard Highway and take a left here. I know how to get to St. Bernard Highway in the First Baptist Church I met. By the way, I know you think this is dumb. There's a story I heard a number of years ago about a seminary professor. He was born and raised in the city of Chicago, taught at the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. His wife was from somewhere in Alabama or Mississippi or somewhere on the southeastern corridor. They're going up to Chicago. Lo and behold, he takes a wrong turn. She says, you turned the wrong way, honey. You missed the exit you were supposed to take. What do you think his response is? Woman, I was born and raised in Chicago. I know exactly where I'm going. And then suddenly, as he tells it, he began to go slower and slower and slower. Anything but admit that he missed his turn. And finally... In the middle of I-55, outside of Chicago, there's a seminary professor with his wife stuck dead still on NSA 55 because he won't relent. He wants respect. You know, I often say it this way, ladies. If he won't hear what you have to say, let him go the wrong way. He'll learn. He'll learn that his wife's the best compass he ever had. Now, what transpires in this this crucial relationship with people and this casual relationship with possessions is that the hurt and the heartache and the stress and the strain, it gets so unbearable that finally that couple is seeking out help. They want to see a pastor or they want to see a Christian counselor and invariably a woman will say something like this. She will say, I, I know that he loves me, but I don't feel his love. And invariably, she's over here, and he jumps up and says, what are you talking about? You've got a roof over your head. you got food in the house, nice clothes, nice furniture. She's saying, well, yeah, I, I know that's nice. I know you love me, but I don't feel your love. He's over here in casual needs. She's over here in crucial needs. And both of them need to pick up the cross and follow Jesus. Now, most people, when they start having the wheels fall off inside of their marriage, they're going to run to a bookstore and they're going to start looking for a book or maybe a friend to talk to. And you're going to see all kinds of stuff that's out there. And the majority of it is not Christian and it's not biblical. And so we, we have this, this critical relationship. And you know, if you don't have your need for security and for satisfaction met by God and, and significance met by God, then, sir, you really don't have anything to give to her. You can't give of her something that you don't have met within yourself. And, ma'am, it's the same way. If you've not received Christ, if you've not entered into a restored relationship with God, then you really have nothing to give to him, nothing to build on. That's why Christ is the rock. Christ is the foundation. Forget about Dr. Ruth or Dr. Laura. And you build, you see, you're, you have another relationship, a coincidental or a common relationship. You're in the world but not of the world. Don't look for the world to solve your marital woes. Be not entangled with the affairs of the world. You're in the world, but not of the world. The world has a way of thinking. The world has a way of fixing things, but that's not the way God would do it. God would do it this way, by bringing you into a relationship with him so that he might create in you that sense of significance, that it might be restored, that you might receive that gift, that sense of security, that it might be restored, that you might receive that gift, that you might have a satisfying relationship with him, and flowing out of that, you can give to her and she can give to you. That's what it means to build on Christ. 
It's not just my life and your life built on Christ, but it's our marriage built on Christ. It's the principles enunciated in the Word of God. It's me saying no to me, saying yes to God, picking up my cross and becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. You know, I've asked more than one of you who are in here today, have you received Christ or are you on the road to receiving Christ? And some of you have said, yes, I have received Christ. And some of you, more than one, have said, I'm on the road to receiving Christ. Well, that road leads right to God's altar. And I want to give you an opportunity to come and respond to his gracious call to have that critical need met so that the blessings and the abundance of God would flow into every relationship on every corner of that cross.